Hello and welcome to Crazy Canuck Trucking. I'm David, the Crazy Canuck, and I'm Bridget, the Size Matters Dakotan. Together, we're going to spin some yarns about trucking. These will be real stories, some true, some may be larger than life, and all will be entertaining. We'll also try to bust some myths or answer any questions you may have about rolling across the asphalt ribbon in North America. So please turn up the volume, tighten your seatbelts, ignore those around you, and if you're driving, please don't become one of our stories. We are 10 8. Welcome back to Crazy Canuck Trucking in our podcast. Glad to have all of you here as listeners. We really appreciate that. Don't forget to go rate us on whatever platform you are currently using to listen to this podcast because just like I manipulate my kids, I have no problem making sure to guilt you all into helping out to give us a good rating. So thank you. Also, if you want to get a hold of us, feel free to use the account on Instagram, Twitter, again, at Crazy Connect Trucking, and also an email, crazyconnecttrucking at gmail.com. All of that is in the show notes, so you don't have to memorize it or write it down really fast. So this is episode number six. Never thought we'd make it this far, but we have. And fun fact, slowly but surely, all of our episodes are also audio versions on YouTube, and you can listen to them there if that's your favorite thing to listen to. So it's been going well. My co-host, David, how are things for you today? Hey, Bridget. I'm in the sunny mountains today, southern BC, very beautiful. It's a million degrees outside, you know, so for a northern boy, it's kind of warm. But uh, everything's looking good and uh, having a lot of fun doing this podcast stuff. It's, it's been quite interesting. We get to talk to some interesting people and it's all good. Well, along those lines, the last podcast that we did was with Angel and she was she's a sweet lady she did a wonderful job of talking about her husband Dale who passed away he was an ice road trucker with you up north and since that episode has aired you received some information back from a fellow ice road trucker how would you feel about sharing that with us oh yeah I got uh so Ben Evern he's from Yellowknife Northwest Territories and uh he was a very close friend of Dale's and he knew Dale even better than I did. And so he sent me in a uh, short little email about what he thought. Should I read that now, Bridget? Yeah. Why don't you give us the gist of what his email was? Okay. So he starts off and he says, my first thought about Dale was how he so obviously loved and respected Angel. The vast majority of guys seem to feel the need to put down their wives for some reason, but Dale didn't try to hide his feelings for her. But you already mentioned that, so. Right from the first time that I met him, it was obvious that he was genuine. He was just who he was. We were heading from Edmonton to Yellowknife for the start of the season and were sent together to the same yard to pick up a couple of loads. Neither of us could find the place, which gave us some amusement. Then an hour into our trip north, Dale saw in his mirror that he had a soft tire on his trailer. You'll know if you drive that it's impressive to spot that from the driver's seat. And I noticed that. He called dispatch and was sent to a tire repair shop. I told him that I'd go a couple of hours up the road to a Timmy's and wait for him there. He was genuinely grateful that I had waited as if it was a major inconvenience. During the season, if we went into into town for a meal or something, Dale was always the first one to get out his wallet and pay for the cab. He was supportive, helpful, and a true friend to me. We made each other laugh, and when he was sent to Yellowknife during the off season, he'd call me and we'd grab a bite to eat. I was pleased to introduce him to my girlfriend, and she told him that she liked him. In your podcast, you mentioned the camaraderie on the ice and I have made lifelong friends on that job. Dale was one, albeit the life part of lifelong was all too short. I hope that you're doing up good there, buddy. Miss ya. So that was from Ben Avern from Yellowknife talking about our mutual friend, Dale Anderson. That's pretty awesome. 
I think that's a great story. And Angel will love hearing that because she so enjoys more and more stories and input from people that knew Dale. She just wants to keep that memory alive and learn those things. So to you, Ben, thank you. I think Angel will appreciate it. Yep. I, I know. Uh... You know, how about something kind of cute and fun? What did you, I think you have another quote to share with us. I do. You know, I have a little, I have two grandsons and one of them is five years old. And of course, as the Jeepa, I, you know, my grandkids are the smartest and best and everything, you know, and, and funny, of course. But anyway, I got a, I got a text from my daughter, his mom, and she says, mom is driving like a crazy person on the 307 in the white shell. And Knox says, that just freaked my nuts. <laughs> I, my kid's got I, a future in comedy, just so you know. Oh, uh, he's he's hilarious. I love I love kids coming up with their comments. It's it's great. <laughs> so we have oh. we have another ice road buddy uh, we do. coming on the air with us today. Um, if let me if introduce. I well, yep. I, I was going to say, if I were to use a 10 code, I would say that our guest today would be a 1017. It's urgent a business. 1017. It is urgent, urgent business. business. We need to talk to Darren. So introduce him. Well, we have on the phone with us, Darren Smith. He's from somewhere way east. I think if you went any further east, you'd fall in the water. So welcome to our little uh, podcast gig here, Darren. You, all three of our listeners will probably be happy to hear from you. <laughs> well, happy to be here. Where are you today? I am in New Brunswick hauling a load of fresh low bush blueberries back to Oxford, Nova Scotia to the processing plant. Are your Out hands of the state stained of Maine. blue? No. Uh, are your hands stained blue? No? No, 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 not today. Not today. Oh, okay. So, Bridget, have you got any questions for this guy? I have a lot. So Darren, you, you uh, told us where you are. Where are you from? How'd you start trucking? Who are you? Well, I grew up on a dairy farm that my family had, and we sold the dairy farm off in spring of 05, and I got my class one license and then started a career in trucking. And I went to the ice road and met David and met Dale which we'd heard about and Dale was mm -hmm. one of the leaders that took me up the ice one of the very first trips true leader in all sense mm -hmm. and I've been tracking coast to coast to coast ever since so where are you originally from the small community of Linden next to the bigger community of Amherst Nova Scotia right up next That's... to the New Brunswick border awesome okay if you couldn't tell, you know, it's a bit of an East Coast accent. Oh, a little, but it's not that bad. <laughs> so for a guy who grew up with dairy cattle, um, and this is coming from a dairy farmer's daughter, and then going to trucking, big transition, big, big change in hours or hard work, or tell me about that. Hours are the same. There is no hours, long hours, seven days a week, round the clock. Um... Mm -hmm. The only good thing is that on Saturday morning, when you got no load of freight to go somewhere, you can roll back over and go back to sleep. <laughs> not like, not like you got to get out and milk the cows every morning. That's a good point. You don't just go out and rub down your uh, truck just because it's there. No, I do not. Oh, okay. I run, I run old iron with lots of miles and I get more miles out of it than, out of them than most. What do you call old? Well, the last truck I had before the one I'm running today was a 2003 Volvo with 2.77 million kilometers on it. And that truck was to the ice road four years. Four years. So, tell me about the ice road. Okay, um, besides what everybody watches on the TV show, what do you think? Is that true to life? Is it not? What would you say is different? And I mean, 
how do you handle that? You know, what you do every day, like today, hauling blueberry bushes, how would you prepare and be ready to be out on the ice versus what you're doing on a regular day? Um, ice roads is nothing like what you see on TV. That's <laughs> sensationalized and everything else up there is safety, 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 because mm -hmm. you're hours and hours, many medical care. Cold is your biggest killer up there or could be. And the environment is not your friend. No. What do you do different and for your truck? I, my old truck that I've taken up there, I've rebuilt it over. I've insulated all my heating lines because whatever heat your engine makes, you've got to be able to keep it. You know, I, belly tarps, close the front grill in, change different fluids, carry lots of spare parts because you've got no parts when you're 400 kilometers back into the bush. you are yeah. got to be self-efficient on your own repairability and repairability of your buddies that's running with you. So, Darren, on the TV show, they make it look like people run fast and loose and do whatever they want. Uh, what, what's the reality? Can you get in trouble by just acting like a hot shot up there? One kilometer over, you'll probably get your finger slapped in a suspension. And five kilometers over, you're banned for life, is my understanding. So where would most people be on their way home from work this afternoon? Yep, that's right. No, there's, there's, there's no fooling around with those rules, is there? No, no. You've got a radar gun pointed at you at any given time. You don't know who or where they're sitting behind a snowbank or anything. But those guys are also the first guys when you cry out, you've got a mechanical issue or a problem. Those guys are the first guys that are on scene to do whatever they can to help you and support you and to get the support you need. So yep, are those right. like Mounties or who's running the radar gun and they're to help? Private run security hired by oh. the mines and the road companies is my understanding. Okay. Yeah, it's all private land so they can um, they hire their own security firm and they have a lot of them. There's a lot uh -huh. of them. Some of them are former officers. Some of them aren't. Um, but they have ultimate power up there and they uh, there's no fooling around. It's not like here you get a when you're down south, you get a ticket for running 10 miles an hour over and you can go on your merry way and you pay a fine. There, it's like you're literally just a little bit over and you are, you either get a five day suspension or you're gone for life. Mm -hmm. So do, do the electronic logs matter? Like when you're up there, Darren, and you're, you're, you're playing by the rules, how does that work? Log books and so forth. I mean, this is all kind of new to me. Well, up there, you've got, once you go into the Northwest Territories, you get the North of 60 rules, which is different from the South. And then you've got ice road provision rules that are different from that again. Okay. So you've got to learn all your different rules and what you can do and what you can't do up there. And e-logs for most of us, we we're still running paper when I was okay. up there. I did not get there last winter. I was there the winter before and we were still running paper. I hear they're going to switch over to electronic this coming year. I used electronic when I was there, but I could edit everything. Um, but basically the hours up there are pretty simple. You need eight hours off in a day and you can work the other 16. So, and you can do that every single day of the week for two months straight if you want. So for the two of you, ice roads or anywhere else that you go, as guys who've driven for a long time, because Darren, if I did my math right, you've been driving since 05, so you've been doing it for 15 years. What do you think about the e-logs? Has this been good or bad for you personally or even the industry? It's good and bad all in the same breath. It's... um. It allows the large companies to track their drivers, I think, a little more tightly. Um, the little independent guy that's wanting some flexibility, it's, it's taking some flexibility out, you know, brings us all supposedly to a higher standard than what we may have been. But my understanding, talking to DOT officers around, 
there's going to be a group of trucks that are still not going to be required to run e-logs after this comes down and I personally have a problem with that if industry's going to it industry should go to it A to Z okay instead of just making it in certain places versus others the long haul industry is what's going to be forced to run to it um, I tried to run it two years ago hauling asphalt doing the construction season and the contractors were wanting us to run beyond the what we could do with our e-logs you can make it work on paper but you can't make it work with these things okay and the, David, and the DOT knows it, but, you know, they're just kind of very quietly being quiet. Mm -hmm. David, it's what do you think? Rule. It's the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes we get caught in the middle of that as truckers. I'm not in favor of having multiple sets of rules. You know, if, if, uh, if one of us has to abide by a certain set of rules then I don't see why other truckers shouldn't have to abide by the same set as well it and and uh, enough of this Canadian and US rules you know we sh why can't we come up with a system that works for all across North America you know it why do we want to work more hours because a lot of people say oh I can't I can't get enough work in well then if you're not getting enough work in, you're still not going to make enough money if that's your problem. You know, we work in the States, we're allowed 70 hours in eight days. What other, what are the other industry besides farming? Is that normal? You know, in Canada, you know, it's 70 um, hours in seven days. I did a run this spring, David, to the U.S. I did 3,500 miles legal U.S. I left Sunday afternoon and I was home before midnight on Friday night, 3,500 miles to the U.S. and back. Yeah. Yep. I was beat. I was beat. Yeah. I came home and did a 36-hour reset and went back out again. So is it fair to say that having, the, having an electronic log in that situation helps you from getting too fatigued or is it more of a detriment to you? I know of a guy that's driven the truck, and he says he slept when he when he run paper. He slept when he was tired. And he drove when he was awake. These e logs yeah. tell us now when we're going to sleep and when we're not going to sleep. When we can yeah. pull up, when we can't pull up. The day the days are coming up to the outside edge of town, pulling into a rest area or a truck stop and taking a couple hours off, let rush hour traffic go, and then running mm -hmm. to our destination are done. Mm -hmm. We now yeah. have to be in the middle of rush hour traffic, fatigued, because there's e-log tells us we can run right yeah and that, is, that is a huge problem yeah because before you could make that decision when you needed to stop and you still had hours to roll so you could go again later and like you said you know just traffic conditions weather conditions i mean as someone who lives in north dakota for me i have to think about when when i need to leave earlier to beat the weather which you can't really do if you know your e-log says you can't move right then Right. Yeah. Right. You know, okay. you, you, you wanted to, you were on the outskirts of town and you wanted to go in for delivery and beat rush hour traffic. Well, I refer to it as the squawk box. The ELD says you can't move, you can't move. Right. Now, now we're stuck in rush hour traffic. Yeah. And you lose, you can lose hours sitting in oh, rush sure. hour traffic. Yep. You, yeah. You lose your, you lose your efficiency plus you're trying to push through time in, in unsafe conditions you know oh absolutely a lot of car drivers don't want to see trucks during rush hour and i don't blame them you know it i i'm all for staying out of cities during rush hour you guys know? i drive a pickup yeah, yeah. and i'm all for staying out of cities in rush hour <laughs> yep you, you know david and, and, and how many times we look at the gps and it's so many hours to a destination and we look at the eld and we've got a half hour to play with, and all of a sudden you're sitting there looking. You're always racing that ELD clock, right? Compared yeah. to the paper, you, 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 okay, you got there when you got there. It fit. Yeah. Now I had inspectors tell me we know that you can't run it exactly like it shows in your logbook, but as long as you come in here and you don't look tired, and you're making it look reasonable, we got no issues with that. Sure. You know, but we don't have that flexibility anymore.
and you can't work around delays you know if you get delayed in road construction and then miss that window of opportunity to keep driving etc yeah and, I, and, I and once it. you lose and once you lose the hours on a monday you never can regain them by friday the, 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 the cld has to make our dispatchers our receivers and our shippers work yeah more closely together and not park us waiting for loads to unload and reload and having our dispatcher sending us out at the right times to make everything work it's put more responsibility on them to make things run smoothly for us the truck driver sure that makes sense i, I know at a place i was at last week that same place that held one of our drivers for 13 hours the uh, week before and you better believe my boss was all over those people hmm. he says i'm not letting my driver sit there for 13 hours again like you have to get this figured out because we can't afford to run that way which i'm so, very thankful um, because i didn't take that long oh absolutely <laughs> so i'm gonna shift gears on you guys see what i did there and oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so darren Tell me, what do, what's your favorite thing to haul? I mean, when you get when you get a load and you're like, yeah, that's going to be great. What's something you really think of then? Well, I've hauled reefer work, gravel and asphalt, flatbed, kind of some of the more enjoyable loads I get in on. It's like farm equipment, industrial, yes. and um, that kind of stuff. Where I'm out slinging chains rather than slinging tarps and pulling and straps. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I, I wouldn't have been surprised to hear you say, whatever load pays me the most money, that's the one I really love to haul. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, 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 it's got to pay or it don't go. Of course. And this, and this is, another, and this is another, another thing the industry has problems with, is, is to get decent paying freight, because there's always someone out there that'll haul it for less than you. Yep. It seems. <laughs> Yeah, yep. the spirit of competition, you could say, is a little bit insane. <laughs> well, I'm not too sure that the industry isn't just plain and simply over trucked. There's more iron yeah. out here than there is freight. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I've, that's not a perspective I have ever heard is someone saying there's too much because every time I go down the road and I see every truck, I mean, especially something that's owned by a company has got a sticker on it that says, you know, looking for more drivers. So that's a good point, Darren. I was at the local truck show a year ago last spring, and all the large companies in the area were there trying to find people, but all they're trying to do is steal, steal them from the other guy or, and, and trying to steal work from them. And you get talking to them, they don't ha you get talking to drivers that are working for them. Oh, well, I'm working three and a half, four days a week, sitting home the rest of the time. Because those, the companies are out trying to get the good drivers. They're getting all kinds of drivers, but to get those exceptional good drivers are hard for them to come by. Absolutely. So when you say the good drivers, would you say the good drivers are working for another company or are they owner operators? Both. Okay. It takes two different it takes two different skill sets. Mm -hmm. As an owner operator, you have to be a businessman first. Mm -hmm. As driving for a company driver, all you got to do is drive. Someone else has got to worry about making the paychecks work. Sure, I like that you answer all my questions, Darren. Because remember, I'm not really involved in the trucking industry. I just know to ask a lot because I'm nosy. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Darren, I, I had told uh, Bridget that you had a funny story to tell us, and uh, well, that just, I'm just that dying just, to hear that. Just that just depends on which. No, that just depends on which side of the mic you're sitting on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny for us. <laughs> it it probably wasn't so funny for you at the time. <laughs> it was not funny for me at the time. It was a little unnerving at the time. <laughs> But I have the feeling you have a lot of good funny stories. <laughs> well, this was a personal experience one. This was that's the scary part of it. Well, bring it up. Now, on. Bridget, you said you, you you said you grew up on a dairy farm. 
I did. We grew up milking Perfect. cows until I was in high school, yes. Okay. So we had a, a fair here. It was called the Maritime Winter Fair. It was kind of a regional large exhibition where the best of the dairy cattle went to be showed. Coming from a dairy herd, purebred dairy herd, I took a few cattle up to the show. Wait, what kind of purebred dairy? What, what's the herd? What was the breed? Thank you, Holsteins, okay. And I was up there, I'll be in my early, late teens, early 20s. And this mm -hmm. show was late October, first part of November. So I mean, it's getting cool, damp nights and such like, and I'm got a pair of coveralls on, probably two sizes too small for the amount of clothing I had on underneath of it. And up there, they gave us, for the exhibitors, what you could refer to as, as the old fashioned hospital bracelets. The old plastic ones, they were green in color. You wore that on your wrist to get in and out of the fair. So I'm down at Tim Hortons, ordering something to eat on my way back to the hotel. Get what I ordered, hopped in the farm pickup, headed down to the hotel, get ready to pull in the hotel and here the cops are, red and blue lights on. I said, okay, so I stopped right in the middle of the parking lot. Then I must be going to want to see my wallet. So I put my drink down in the truck cab, start reaching for my wallet in through all these clothes I had on. <laughs> Police officer comes up and says, put your hands on the steering wheel, sir. Okay. Hands go back to the steering wheel. I look in the rear view mirror past him to the cruiser where the second officer is standing in the doorway with the door open with, I'm sure, his hand on the revolver. And he said, hmm, I said to myself, this ain't looking good. <laughs> so the officer asks a few questions and looks at the bracelet and says, what's that? And I said, it's the exhibitor's pass for the fair in town. And, okay. Well, he said, someone from Tim Hortons reported that they thought someone had broke out of the mental hospital here in Moncton, seen the green bracelet. I said, ah, that's great. That's funny. He says, now can I see your driver's license, please, sir? My hands are still wrapped tightly around the steering wheel. I said, now can I take my hands off the steering wheel to get my wallet out of my back pocket? Yes. So I get my license out, and he goes back and comes back and apologizes. And But it weren't funny for my seating. I bet it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, so, you, so you lied and told him you were at the fair and not the escapee. Is that was right. that what I'm hearing there? <laughs> well, I didn't I didn't escape from any hospital at that point. At that point, there okay. are days I want. <laughs> there are days you know, being an owner operator. I wonder if I came from the funny firm. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll be honest. If I was that kid wearing my coveralls, I'd been working with cows all day. The minute I opened the pickup window, I think they would have understood <laughs> by the smell of dairy manure where I was from. <laughs> Uh, it was, it, it, it weren't funny at the time. <laughs> man, I bet not. <laughs> oh, man. There, we, we run across some funny stuff out here, don't we? Well, I heard tell of a story that a car passed a guy in a gravel truck one day, and a woman was sitting with her legs crossed driving her sports car with the laptop sitting on the passenger seat and her typing away on the laptop driving down the road at 110 kilometers an hour. Oh, good Lord. When not, the cops pulled not, her up, the story was that she was doing a French immersion lesson. Dude, I'm not oh, coordinated oh. enough for that. I mean, I don't have enough limbs to type and any, no, I can't even do it sitting at my desk. <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of texters out there these days. Or people that uh, think that by putting their phone on speakerphone, it is now not a handheld phone, even mm -hmm. though they're still holding it in their hand. Right. And the cops can tell you that they pe pull people over for doing that. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have the phone up to my ear, but it's still not hands free if you're holding it. That's right. Do you two feel that if a driverless car actually was available, would that help the situations out on the highway in your opinion? We have to talk, not laugh guys. <laughs> It changes the problems. Okay. Yeah, I, I think there's <laughs> there's definitely some people we don't want on the roads anymore, and their cars are basically driverless already. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> but I don't trust driverless cars yet because they can't make a vehicle that has all the sensors working all the time. And until they Looking get around. these sensors figured out, I don't want to see driverless cars because they're going to run into me. Well, how many years have we been fighting with engine sensors in our trucks and we still can't get them to run right? Oh, that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, it, it's crazy. Most of the problems out here these days are because a sensor has failed, not because of a mechanical issue. It's simply a sensor. And that's what runs these driver, driverless cars. Or the wiring or the wiring to the sensors. How many yep. times do we have chafed wires in these trucks? You yep. know, it's all, it's all part of that technology that's still in its infancy, unfortunately. Reality is there is a good chunk of cars on the road today that have a check engine light on that's been ignored. So that's not going to change with a driverless car. <laughs> They're just going to ignore it too. <laughs> My girlfriend's got a car and it's got lane, sh uh, lane placement assist and all this other stuff. And she had to turn a lot of it off. She said, mm -hmm. all it would take me car go by and all of a sudden the car would jump. You come up on a car, get ready to pass and it would kick the cruise off. It just, I said, just yeah. imagine what it's going to be like in the 401. And she said, it'd be a nightmare. Yeah. And weather conditions uh, where I live. I get a little nervous about some of the automatic features on a vehicle because when they try to take over and that's unexpected for you as a driver, just what your girlfriend is saying, Darren, it's hard for you to be able to control your vehicle when you have to fight against it. Well, you're yeah. not sure what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. Think of your backup camera and all the dirt and mud and snow that builds up on that thing and try to equate that to, you know, that's the seeing eye of a vehicle. How are you going to fix it? I mean, okay, it'll work down. Driver, this car will work great down in the down in the desert in a normal temperature all the time, but snow and ice and mud, rain, what's going to happen then? Right. I know my, my sensors in my pickup, my bumper sensors, don't work very well at all in a snowstorm. Well, actually, they work really well. It's like, you're going to hit something. No, that snowflake won't bother me but it's still telling me that there's still snowflakes in front of me. And it doesn't know the difference between a snowflake and a car yet. So Darren, as we kind of wrap up with our discussion and fun today, what are, if, if there's something that you have in your mind that you would like to make sure that our listeners hear and it's other truckers and other drivers, what do you think that would be? I guess give us the respect out on the road that we need. You know, remember wh whatever you've, Bought, we brought it, you know, give us the room when we, you know, going down the road, getting around yards and stuff. Don't pinch us on space. I guess that, you know, kind of general. Sounds to me like we're back to 1017. That's rather urgent business. Give us the respect, make some room, and <laughs> just be smart. I think that's yeah, a good I way mean, to you know. So to everyone who tuned in today, or whichever day you were able to listen. Thank you for making it this far with us. Please contact us for any stories you may want to share. You can be anonymous if needed. Please share, give us five-star ratings, and stay tuned for more stories. Thank you to Jesse James Dupree and Dixie Incorporated for letting us use their song, It Didn't Fall From The Sky, which if you haven't listened to it, it's great fun. I really kind of love it. And thank you for listening to us. Thank you to Jesse James Dupree and Dixie Inc. for letting us use their song, It Didn't Fall From The Sky. I appreciate every one of you that is listening, rating us. Please send in a story or comments. And uh, thank you very much to our fantastic editor, Big T. You all have a great day. Be safe. 10-7.